thanks very much. Okay, so um, before I start, can you put your hand up if you're an engineer or you do some kind of fluid mechanics related thing? Okay, cool. So I think this is, this is uh, designed with the non-fluid non dynamicist in, in mind, so hopefully you'll be able to follow it. Um, so a bit of background before I start on the, um, the work that I do on preventing failure of tidal turbines. Um, as I'm sure you know, if you've read a newspaper at any point in the last 20 years, uh, we want to, as a, a world, certainly as the EU, emit less carbon. Um, but if we want economic growth, that's the exact opposite. So this is um, carbon, well, gigawatt hours of energy consumption against time. And as the economy's grown, up to 2009, uh, carbon emissions have grown. Um, and then here, this is the, uh, the credit crunch in 2008, and that's the only time we've managed to drop our emissions. So um, that context of power consumption being basically proportional to economic growth um, puts the 2050 target of going down to 20% of our 2010 emissions um, makes it even harder, basically. So as we go to 2050, if we want business as usual economic growth, we would be up here in terms of fossil fuel emissions. So to get down to 20% of 2010, we've got to do an enormous amount of cutting of carbon. Um, but perhaps we might be able to keep our emissions constant over that period. So have economic growth but do it in a way that doesn't emit any more carbon. And Sokolow um, did a piece of work where he said, maybe we could split this into seven, I'm not quite sure why, seven wedges, and make a different wedge, each wedge from a different source of saving carbon. So um, one wedge for the whole world, uh, in order to keep going up here, is 20 megatons of carbon per year per year. So each of these is one gigaton of carbon a year in 50 years time. So if you kind of roughly work out the UK's emissions, that's about 0.35 megatons. So we need a way for each of these wedges, you need to save 0.35 megatons of carbon per year per year. And then you can keep your emissions constant over 50 years. So if you kind of did any maths at school, you can, you can make a wedge by either using less energy or making less carbon to get that energy. Um, so I'm just going to, before I start talking about the actual technical stuff, I'm going to show you how, what we'd need to do to make one of those wedges from tidal power. And tidal power in the UK is quite attractive because we have a lot of it. Uh, we've got a lot of coast and we're in a place where the tidal range is quite big. And it's very predictable. So... Um, uh, you, can, you can tell the grid in advance when you're going to make power, which sets it apart from stuff like wind and solar, where um, you can change minute by minute without any predictability. Um, tides are driven by the moon and the sun, by the relative position of the moon, the earth and the sun, and um, basically you've got flow being forced from deep to shallow. And then back again. And what's interesting is when most of that flow is quite slow, but when you zoom in um, to this part here, which is called the Alderney Race in the Channel Islands um, and loads of other locations around the UK and in the English Channel, um, you get flow forced um, very fast through these narrow channels by the tide. And in that place, you've got a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of energy in the flow that you could extract using a turbine. So if you pick out good locations like this, you can build something like this that looks like a bit like a wind turbine, but it ends up sort of stumpier, basically. And then you could say, you could put them across here and generate a load of power. And that sounds quite good. So how many would we need? Well, here's a uh, one gigawatt power station. So that's a thousand megawatts. It makes about 2.3 megatons of carbon. And it's kind of always available. So we'll say it's capacity factors one. Um, here's our turbine. Uh, the ones they're designing at the moment are about 1.2 megawatts. And without wishing to state the obvious, you can only generate power of this thing when the tide's moving. So you could estimate about 0.3 of the time, about a third of the time, the, the tide's going fast enough to generate, a, generate power. 
So this thing's going to kind of average out over a year at 0.36 megawatts. So then you can work through the, um, the maths. Of, if we go back to our wedges, our wedge was 0.35. So we need to replace 15% of one of these each year, which means we need 150 megawatts from tidal power turbines, which means we need 420 each year. So if we installed 420 turbines every year for 50 years, we'd get one of our seven wedges to stabilize out our um, power, uh, our carbon emissions. So 420 doesn't sound like too many. It's like one, one and a bit a day. So how are we doing about that? At that? Well, um, the biggest project in the UK is the Maygen project. Um, they're promising just under 400 megawatts by the early 2020s. And they have actually now got six megawatts of power on the grid. Um, so they are making progress. These things are actually, they're, not, they're no longer just uh, a drawing on an engineer's computer. Uh, they are now proper pieces of hardware connected to the grid selling power, but there's only four of them, which is not very close to 420 per year. So the big problem with these is that the cost is high, but also the cost is uncertain. Um, we're not sure how long these things are going to last once they get in the water. So we need to make them more reliable, and this was a quite high profile failure. Quite a few high profile failures happened with early prototypes, which didn't really help anyone. Um, but uh, this kind of news article is not what you want um, if you're trying to make a business case to some bank to, um, that they'll get a return. Um, it's possible um, that government subsidies could change this, but really the predictability is the problem. So now I'm going to talk a bit about how a tidal turbine works and how we can therefore make it more reliable. So the turbine um, has got three blades which rotate. Um, and as they rotate, um, they're aerofoils. So the flow comes in at this angle, leaves at that angle, which generates lift and drag. Or as far as the turbine's concerned, torque, which is what pulls the blades around to generate um, power. And thrust, which is just a backwards bending loading on the blades and the support structure, but it's an inevitable consequence of, of generating power. So if we zoom in on the aerofoil, all an aerofoil does is forces the flow to change direction. And if you've ever held your hand under a hand dryer or a tap, if you want the flow to be deflected, you have to exert a force that way. So the, the, the flow is pushing the aerofoil up and the aerofoil is pushing the flow down. So that's how we make lift, by changing the direction of the flow. If the incidence into the blade changes, then the amount of turning changes, and therefore the amount of force changes. So if I suddenly have less incidence, I get less lift. And if I suddenly have more incidence, I get more lift. Now the problem is that I said earlier that the tidal flow was really predictable, and it is, the average is really predictable, but if you've ever seen the sea, you'll know it has waves in it, and you'll know that the seabed is not flat and there's things like headlands, and all of that combines to generate um, gusts. So the flow is changing on a second-by-second -second basis. Um, so the flow coming into the turbine is very predictable, 15-minute average you can get absolutely accurately. But on a second-by-second -second basis, you can't. So what that means is that we suddenly have a change in um, incidence all the time. So it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, which means more lift, more torque, and then suddenly less lift, less torque. So what we want to do is find another way of changing the lift generated by the aerofoil. And what we can do is we can change how curved the aerofoil is. So uh, a more curved aerofoil turns the flow more at the back and therefore generates more lift, and a less curved aerofoil generates less lift. So these two situations have exactly the same amount of lift. One is high inc uh, low incidence, the red line, and high curvature. And the other is high incidence and low curvature. So what we need to be able to do is somehow change the shape of the aerofoil as the gusts change the flow coming into the um, turbine. Now, changing the whole aerofoil is kind of hard and expensive and has lots of moving parts, and it's likely to make the aerofoil weak. But... Um, People who've been playing with aerofoils for 100 years or so, um, the plane designers, 
have come up with a way of changing the shape of an aerofoil using just the flap on the back. So that's only part of the aerofoil, but you can see the green part with the flap up has a lot less turning than the red part with the flap down. So we thought that might be quite a neat way of doing it. So we built a tidal turbine, a model one. This one does not make a megawatt of power. And uh, we fitted flaps um, to the blades to see if we could uh, mitigate some loading. Um, and we had a mechanism inside, uh, which you can see schematically here, driven by a little, um, this is a, a servo motor powered by an Arduino. So it's su super high tech um, inside here and some AA batteries. Um, but the flap moves backwards and forwards. Um, and what we did is we tested it um, in a big tank of water in France. Uh, so we generated waves and we measured um, the loading on the blade with and without the flaps. And what we found was, I'm not going to show you the, the actual data, but what we found was that the thrust loading went down by 60%. So that's the, the bending backwards of the blades. When we were able to counteract the waves with the flaps, we got down to 60% less. But we didn't do anything about the torque loading. So torque is power, but it's also the, the fatigue on the shaft and the drivetrain and the gearbox. Um, so the flaps affected um, the thrust quite nicely. So then we thought, actually, even this is a pretty big moving part. Um, you're putting this, this the, the loads on a tidal turbine are enormous because water's quite heavy compared with air, and you really don't want a moving part this big. Um, and we might want to do something about the thrust fluctuation, the torque fluctuations as well. So we thought, can we use a smaller moving part? Um, and the answer to that is maybe. Uh, so we thought about using a trip. Um, and this is a, another schematic of the um, uh, aerofoil. And what happens on the surface of an aerofoil is um, the flow uh, very close to the aerofoil has to be, has to be stationary. So it's it's decelerated to, to not move at all um, because it's basically stuck to the surface of the aerofoil. And then what that means is a thing called a boundary layer forms on the blade, where you've got slow flow near the blade and fast flow far away from the blade. <coughs> and between this point on the aerofoil, which is the lowest pressure point, and the back of the aerofoil, we're forcing the flow to go from low pressure to high pressure, which decelerates it. So this slow flow near the blade, all of the flow gets slower, but this slow flow near the blade gets even slower and slower and eventually starts going backwards. And when it starts going backwards, it separates and it stops following the blade. So on a well-designed normal, normal blade we would, or aerofoil, we'd expect the flow to, to remain attached and to follow the blade more or less to the back. If I put this big trip here, it forms a blockage and takes away some of the momentum of this flow near the, blade, near the surface. And so when it starts to be decelerated, it reverses more quickly. So we get an early separation and we get less turning. So by using a trip here, we can stop the flow from following the blade all the way around and make it stop following it from here and get less turning. The disadvantage of this is that the boundary layer is um, the notoriously hard to predict part of the flow. And therefore, um, we can't just look up in an aerofoil design textbook what size and shape of trip to use. So before we went to France and tested um, on the expensive uh, model turbine tests, we did some tests in the wind tunnel with just a 2D aerofoil. And we basically found that trips do do what we want them to do. So this is a plane trip. Um, and uh, this is just a schematic. I'm not going to show you the actual data. Um, it did cause an early separation, so the flow stopped following the blade. The problem with this plane trip is that it also produces a separation bubble here. Separation bubbles are bad because they can suddenly burst. So um, the danger with the plane trip is that instead of causing a separation here, like a nice subtle change in the lift, we'll get a separation from here. So we'll get the flow basically going straight and not doing any turning. So this is kind of doing what we want, but if anything's slightly out of line because we didn't design it quite right, it will be a complete disaster and just throw away all of our lift. But what we found was that if we put serrated trips on, as the flow goes through this trip, we still get the loss of momentum and therefore the early separation. But um, these little tiny vortices form and that prevents the separation bubble. So this does what we want and there's no dangerous bubble. <laughs> 
So we tested that again uh, in the flume tank in France, and this time it turned out that the trips um, didn't affect the thrust at all, so we couldn't do anything about that backwards bending of the blade. But um, they do affect the torque. So we managed to get the torque fluctuations down by 75%, which means less load on the gearbox and on the drivetrain. But really what we would quite like to do is, instead of taking a design and saying, OK, this has a really big response to the gusts caused by the waves, we'd like to design a, that stick some flaps or some trips on it and make it less. We'd like to design a turbine where the blade doesn't respond somehow to unsteadiness in the first place. And that's what I'm looking at now um, with my PhD student. And she's looking at um, smarter blade design. So the first thing she did was try to get designers able to predict the loading. So I said earlier that there's uncertainty about how long these turbines will last. The problem is that um, the uh, predictions of the unsteady loading due to these gusts can be wildly inaccurate. So what they do is they take a correlation from the 1930s that assumes that a tidal turbine blade is an infinite 2D aerofoil. And that gives them this magic black line here. So then the designer says, OK, well, I've got a reduced frequency of 0 0.4. Therefore, my loading is going to be about 0.75. Turns out, if you take into consideration the fact that the blade is not infinite, which is kind of wise, probably, uh, and the fact that it's rotating, and the fact that it's probably not got the same design all the way along, you get these black dots here, which are totally different. To give you an idea of the, the, the kind of size of error of fatigue life, um, this would be a 20% error in loading. So you can see that these loadings are way more than 20% different. 20% difference in loading means an order of magnitude difference, so a factor of 10 difference in fatigue life. So we, by being more than 20% better at predicting the loading, we can be more than an order of magnitude better at um, predicting the fatigue life. But even more than that, we can now turn the problem inside out. So we can try and design blades that respond, because we know about the differences that different design features will make. We can um, design blades that are less um, responsive to unsteady loading. And we can basically do that by decomposing that little dot. Instead of just saying, OK, that's my magic number, 1.05, that's my loading. We can actually look at the um, modes of the, um, of the blades. Uh, and what they are is basically, it's a bit like um, if you have a mass spring and a damper um, and they have a natural frequency and a mode shape that it goes into, um, or an organ pipe will resonate at a certain, certain frequency. So this is the same thing, but in, two, in 3D for a tidal turbine blade. So what this means is if the gust looks anything like this in terms of its shape and size, the turbine will respond very strongly to it. So the next step with this project is going to be to um, play around with the design parameters of the tidal turbine blade and try and make a turbine where these modes don't look anything like the shape of gusts that we'll find in the sea and therefore make a turbine that just won't, where its response will be quite flat and it won't respond to the gusts. So um, the sort of question that we asked before was could we make a meaningful amount of power from the sea? Could we make a, a wedge, a seventh of our um, business's usual power um, from the sea? Uh, I think we could. Tidal power could contribute a um, substantial amount. Estimates vary between 10 and 20% of our power. Um, and it's very predictable. So uh, if you can put a reliable turbine in the sea, you can sell your power to the grid um, with uh, reasonable accuracy, which is very important. But at the moment, um, I've shown you some of the reasons why it's expensive and unreliable. Uh, so the big challenge really is to work on, work on reducing these uh, fatigue loadings and preventing the failure of devices. So that's me. Um, I'll take questions. Yeah.